True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Carol Newlander was a mother, a business owner, and also the wife of respected rabbi Fred Newlander. On most Tuesdays, she drove home with the receipts from her popular bakeries, carrying thousands of dollars in her purse. Then came the Tuesday evening when two men showed up at her front door. Join us at the quiet end for The Good Wife, Carol Newlander. While Carol was devoting herself to her home, her children, her business, and their temple community, Rabbi Fred Newlander was having sex with other women. But did Fred's infidelity mean that he was capable of making his wife a target for murder? Forensic evidence was scarce, but a strong circumstantial case would be put together over time. So this is going to be a fascinating discussion. Let's get our beer review. We have a beer for today from Kane Brewing Company in Ocean, New Jersey. It's black is beautiful. There are several breweries that brewed beers for the Black Lives Matter movement. This is Kane's. It's an American Imperial Stout, 10% alcohol by volume. Black looking beer, large creamy head that retained well. Nice roasted malt aroma. Coffee taste, mostly some chocolate. Just a tiny hint of licorice. This is a, a big bodied beer, but still very smooth. Good one to drink. All right, Dickie, you know what we do next. Let's open it up. We'll open this beer. Okay, your quiet end or mine? Oh, we went to yours last time, (laughs) so you come over to my quiet end. Okay, here I come. All right. All right, I'm going to let you start things off. So, Carol Newlander was born Carol Toby Litz. She was the daughter of wealthy parents who owned a button factory in New York City's garment district. She grew up in an expansive estate with a sister and two brothers. The children were cared for by a governess, and the family employed a full-time butler. So they had some money. Mm Mm-hmm, I would guess. Now, this is a very different upbringing than Fred Newlander had. Fred's parents were immigrants who owned a dry-cleaning business. Fred was the only child. The Newlanders had a simple lifestyle, but they also had deep respect for education, and they were very proud of the fact that they had six generations of rabbis in the family. So Fred met Carol on a blind date. That was in 1963. He was a senior at Trinity College studying religion and philosophy. Carol was a junior at Mount Holyoke College studying psychology. Back in the 60s, the thing was for a guy to give his steady girlfriend his college pin, and then they would be pinned. So after just a few dates, Carol was wearing Fred's pin. Wasn't too long after that when they announced their engagement, and then they were married in 1965 after they both had graduated. So Fred's in-laws weren't sure about him at first. As Carol stood next to her dad about to walk down the aisle on her wedding day, He whispers to her that it wasn't too late he could get her out of this wedding, but she wanted to go through with it. I would think that there's not an insignificant number of parents of fathers who say that same thing to their daughters. Yeah, I think it's a good thing to say because you don't want them to think they have to go through with it just because you've paid for the church and the reception hall and everything. You know, it's never too late until after you say I do. Right. And I said that to my daughter. Yes, you did, right? Yeah. Fat lot of good that did. (laughs) So Carol and Fred lived in New York. Then they moved to Queens, and that's where Fred earned his degree in Hebrew literature. Then in 1968, he was ordained as a rabbi. They moved to Philadelphia, and that's where Fred earned a graduate degree. They were married for just three years when he was hired as an assistant rabbi at Temple Emmanuel in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. In 1974, Fred left the Temple Emmanuel and opened Makor Shalom Temple. The following year, they bought a nice two-story house in Cherry Hill, and they started a family. 
they would have three children, two sons, Matthew and Benjamin, and a daughter named Rebecca. In the 60s, developers had a building boom in Cherry Hill, and there was this growing suburban sprawl, but also more roads were paved. So by the late 90s, the main road was just very busy, and it was actually just covered with franchise shops and fast food places. Fred built a strong reputation as a cultural and spiritual leader, very well liked in the Jewish community. And as the community grew, Fred decided to move his temple to a larger building. So in 1991, he moved the temple from a converted warehouse to a custom-built 42,000-square-foot synagogue complex just a few miles away from his house. And Kor Shalom was the eighth synagogue in Sherry Hill, and the largest. One-third of the 70,000 Sherry Hill residents were Jewish. By 1994, Mkor Shalom had over 4,000 members. Over 900 families saw it as the center of their spiritual and social lives. So it really was a community. It was. And the congregation was like a large extended family. Carol was loved and well-respected, and she was always available to listen to stories or concerns about their lives. She was bright, funny, and warm. And she was very busy. Extremely busy. I'm impressed with all that she did. I'm amazed. Her weeks were just filled with errands, seeing friends, shopping, visiting the synagogue, working in her bakery company, and also she did projects for charities and civic groups on top of that. On Tuesdays, Carol spent her mornings at the Classic Cake Company store she owned in Voorhees. That's a township adjacent to Cherry Hill. Then on Tuesday afternoons, she attended a weekly business meeting for her management staff. Carol had started this baking company in 1982 by baking kosher cakes in her home and filling orders from local restaurants. Her first location was in a Audubon, New Jersey storefront. It started out as a niche, but soon Classic Cake was selling baked goods for Christmas and Easter, as well as Passover and Hanukkah. So it wasn't just the Jewish community anymore. It wasn't. And she did very, very well. In 1987, she sold ownership shares to a 31-year-old baker and cake decorator. He had been her head baker. After the sale, he ran the company, but Carol handled the business side of things. So she was still working as the manager of the business. 1992, a second classic cake bakery was opened and the baker's clerks and truck drivers added up to over 40 employees. So that's a full-time job right there. Isn't it? But this... she still has, well, I mean, at this point her kids were older, so you didn't have to worry about them, but she still had a lot on her plate. Absolutely. So the weekly business meeting on Tuesdays was held at the Cherry Hill home of the company's human resources director. And these meetings normally last for three or more hours. After this meeting, Carol normally drove home, and she would make dinner. Cherry Hill was very safe. There hadn't been any homicides in Cherry Hill in 1994. But, you know, Carol did have this risky routine of taking home the day's cash receipts from these two bakery locations. Still, to her, it seemed okay to do, as long as no one outside of the family or the business knew about it, and as long as she deposited the money the next morning, she really didn't see any reason to worry. Yeah, but certainly if the wrong people knew about this, that would put her at risk, right? Absolutely, yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah, she's driving home with anywhere from $5,000 to $15,000. And then when she'd get home, she'd sit down at her kitchen table and count the money out and get it ready for deposit. And often not even lock the front door. Nope. So, and, and at the same time, the convenience stores and gas stations that lined the street near where she lived, they had been robbed several times most of the time for no more than a few hundred dollars each time. If word got out about Carol's banking system, (laughs) I guess I'd call it that, if word did get out, Carol would be definitely a more profitable target. Yeah, and you would think more low risk, really. Yeah. For Mm -hmm. the robbers. Yep. So on the evening of October 25th, 1994, Carol was driving home from her Tuesday night meeting and talking on her car phone with her daughter, Rebecca. Rebecca was 24 years old and the Newlander's oldest child. She was working as a hospital administrator in Philadelphia, 
but she and her mother spoke every day still. After Carol pulled into her driveway, she stayed in the car and finished her call with Rebecca. And it was dark by this time. It was a cold night. So Carol was really startled when someone knocked on her car window. Oh, I would be. Yeah. And this was a large man in a windbreaker who was standing at the driver's side window in their driveway. And the man asked Carol if the rabbi was home. He said he had a package for him. So Carol said that the rabbi was not home, and she invited this guy into the house, telling Rebecca that she shouldn't have been surprised, really, because Fred had told her to expect someone. On the other end of the phone, Rebecca heard pieces of the conversation. It was late and it was dark out, so Rebecca was mildly concerned about her mom. She asked Carol to call her back as soon as the man left, just so she would know her mom was okay. Now that's funny to me, funny strange, because wouldn't it be better to stay on the phone with her? If you say, call me back when he leaves, she could be dead by then. Well, yeah, that's one thing. But I guess she wasn't that concerned. No, she I just, don't think she just was. She wanted confirmation that everything went okay. Right, right. So, and Carol didn't seem at all uncomfortable with this guy. He just seemed pretty harmless. But as he followed her into the house, he had some sinister plans. Apparently, though, as we learned later on, he was looking for something that he was supposed to take, and he didn't see it. So his plan wasn't going the way it was supposed to. No, and he didn't have a backup plan. And as he tried to think on his feet, he fell short and just started to panic. So as soon as this man and Carol entered the house, there was an accomplice who would be walking up through the bushes to the corner of the house. The accomplice was there, hiding in the shadows, holding a lead pipe, and watching the front door for his cue. The man in the house needed to buy some time to figure out what he was going to do. He asked Carol then if he could use her bathroom. Carol pointed him in the direction of the first floor bathroom near the back of the house. And as he passed through the kitchen, he was looking again. He was looking for money. So seeing none, he decided he needed to leave and return to carry on this plan another night. He came out of the bathroom, gave Carol a small white envelope, and said, well, here's the message for the rabbi. Will you give it to him? And she said, sure. Yeah, but then she opened the envelope, which he was definitely not expecting. So she called to the man, said, you know, there's nothing in here. And he mumbled something about, oh, I guess I picked up the wrong envelope. So Carol told him that he could wait. Fred's going to be home soon. But by this time, this guy just wants to get out of there. He was pretty nervous. He told Carol that someone was waiting for him in his car, and then he left in a, a very big hurry. Yeah, he met up with his accomplice out front, and they walked to their car and took off. Inside the house, Carol just tore up the envelope and tossed it in the trash, and she didn't give it really any thought after that that we know of. No. But then Carol picked up the house phone and called her daughter, Rebecca, back and told her about the empty envelope that the man had given her and that he had used the bathroom, which she thought was kind of odd and funny. So they laughed a little bit about that encounter. So a week exactly after this first attempt, the plan to kill Carol Newlander was back in play. It was another Tuesday. Carol had spent her day working a classic cake, and then at 4.30 she went to the weekly business meeting. She left the meeting just after 7.30. And then as soon as she was home, she called Rebecca for their usual daily chat. And while she's talking to Rebecca, there's a knock at the front door. She was in the dining room. She answered the door in her socks. She had the portable phone to her ear. She peeked out the oval window in the door. She knew nothing about this guy at her door, but she did recognize him from the last week. His earlier visit had seemed pretty comical to Carol, and she had mentioned him in some family conversations. She called him the bathroom man. In fact, as she sees who's at the door, she says to Rebecca, oh, it's the bathroom guy. Now, he'd been in the house a week before, so she didn't hesitate to open the door and invite him in. It's November 1st, 1994, the day after Halloween. So the fact that both visits by the bathroom man happened on a Tuesday night unfortunately didn't occur to Carol or she just didn't recognize the significance of that. Rebecca also didn't think about that. She did hear some of her mother's conversation with the man, and it sounded totally benign. Rebecca heard the man say, Hi, it's me again. Then she heard her mother say, Why don't you wait? 
A few seconds later, Carol said, Well, don't leave him outside, it's cold. So if you base this on the previous week, it seems that Carol thought the man had a companion with him again. But when Carol looked outside, she didn't see a car or anyone else. This time, the bathroom man and his accomplice, who he called Deuce, had parked two houses down the street. So Deuce was staying out of sight, according to the plan. He was creeping up to the house and trying to see inside through the windows. He was wearing all black as he stood just outside of the door and waited. So Carol told the bathroom man, have a seat, sit down here in the living room, I'll finish my phone call. So he took a few steps towards the living room, but he stopped because he saw Deuce's shadow outside the window in the middle of the front door. He wanted his accomplice to see what was going on inside. So Carol finishes her call with Rebecca, saying everything's fine. She hung up the phone. So Fred Newlander also had his own Tuesday evening routine. He had evening meetings and classes at the synagogue, but Carol expected him home any minute. So she escorted the bathroom man towards the back of the house to the sunroom, and as he followed her, he had this short lead pipe he was hiding in his coat. So when Carol stepped into the front room, the bathroom man put his left hand on her shoulder, and with his right hand he hit Carol hard on the back of the head. The blow knocked off her glasses, and she staggered forward, likely in complete shock. Her scalp was lacerated and bleeding profusely. Then the man pushed her forward onto her knees before he walked back to the front door a few feet away from her. And as he opened the front door for Deuce, Carol was still alive. She was moaning and just asking why. She couldn't understand why anyone would do this to her. No, so Deuce comes inside. He took the pipe from the bathroom man. He walked over to where Carol was lying on the living room floor. As the bathroom man waited on the front porch steps, he could hear the horrible thumps as Deuce bludgeoned Carol Newlander to death. After at least ten blows had been struck on Carol's head, the bathroom man went inside and told Deuce it was time to go. So this was absolutely a brutal murder. It was horrible. Yeah. And the lead pipe was covered in blood and hair. The bathroom man then went into the living room to confirm that Carol was dead. And the scene was just so gory there, it was like surreal. So he couldn't have been prepared for this horrible scene. Just moments earlier, that Newlander living room had been almost completely white. White couch and white carpet. But now Carol's blood was just everywhere. A large pool spread out on the white carpet around her head. The movement of the pipe had left arcs of splatter on the walls and furniture. Even on the wall at the opposite side of the room. Even the ceiling had some blood spatter. Just a horrible scene. Yeah, absolutely. So he bent down to see Carol's face, and her mouth was filling with blood, and her hands were up in an attempt to protect herself. He heard Carol take her final breath, which he later described as like air hissing out of a tire. They still had to bring something with them, right? Remember the first time? It wasn't there. So before leaving the house... Bathroom man looked around the first floor, and then he saw Carol's purse on the dining room table. He pulled it open, found the wallet he'd been looking for. So he didn't look inside the wallet, but he put the wallet into the pocket of his windbreaker. Then he tossed the purse into the living room carpet near Carol's body. The two men rushed out of the house to their car. So as they headed to the highway, they passed two police cruisers. And they were just a few yards from the police as they waited out a red light. And Deuce is sitting in the passenger seat with blood-soaked clothing and the bathroom man next to him with the blood-covered pipe, the wallet, and nervous as hell. Yeah, so if they'd been pulled over, they would have been done. They would have been. At 9 p.m., the killers parked a couple of spaces from the bathroom man's white 1982 Pontiac. The plan was for Deuce to take the Pontiac to pick up his girlfriend and go home. If anyone asked, he would claim to be at home watching TV all evening. Before they separated, the killers looked in the burgundy wallet, and they were shocked to find only $150 inside. They'd been expecting thousands from the bakery receipts. The wallet did have several credit cards, but they weren't going to use anything that could be traced back to them. So they split the cash and threw the rest into a duffel bag, where they also stashed the bloody pipe, and Deuce's blood-soaked clothing. 
Also, just to be careful, the bathroom man put his windbreaker into the bag as well. Now, the bathroom man had his own Tuesday night rituals. He stopped at the 7-Eleven on Main Street, just three miles or so from the New Lander house. He poured four cups of coffee and put plastic covers on them. Then it was only a couple minutes' drive to his destination, which was the Evesham Township Police Department. Once inside, he walked back to the detective bureau, where he handed out the coffees to the night shift crew. It was only 9.12 p.m., so he was less than 10 minutes off his usual Tuesday arrival time. So he pretty calmly sat in the room with detectives all around him and chatted casually with them just 30 minutes after he had bludgeoned Carol to death, some customer. So kind of hiding in plain sight. Yeah. Well, Rabbi Fred Newlander had his full Tuesday schedule on November 1st, 1994. That afternoon, he drove from the temple to his house at 6 p.m. to have dinner with their older son, Matthew. Matthew was a med student at Rutgers. He was living at home with his parents and working part-time as a Cherry Hill EMT. His younger brother, Benjamin, was 18, and he was a freshman at the University of Michigan. So Matt was the only one of the Newlander's offspring who was still living there. He and his parents liked to have dinner together as often as possible before Matthew went to work his 12-hour night shift. And that evening, Fred and Matthew had pizza together. Then at 6.30, Matthew headed off to work, and Fred returned to the synagogue. The synagogue was really more than a full-time position for Fred. There were 4,000 members, and there were 1,000 children attending the school there. Things were going well, and now Fred had this younger assistant rabbi who helped out. He had actually just returned to work after a six-month sabbatical, but he'd really just spent that time at home, and he'd grown a ponytail which really wasn't very popular with the congregation at all. Assistant Rabbi Gary Mazo was, had taken over most of the adult Jewish classes, and he taught the Tuesday night classes. So on the night of Carol's murder, Fred decided to walk around the synagogue complex and see how things were going. He spoke with some members of the congregation and guests who were having a weekly Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. He then dropped by choir practice and chatted with some of those members. He sat in two of the assistant rabbi's classes and made several phone calls about synagogue business. So it was a longer than usual evening at the synagogue, and Fred had actually met up with several people that he normally wouldn't have. He left after nine after waving goodbye to the security guard who was directing the traffic at the intersection. You know, this whole thing on this Tuesday night was out of character for Fred. He usually didn't do all this schmoozing and dropping in on meetings and classes. Yeah, like never did that before. Right. So he's trying to, obviously, in hindsight, establish an alibi. Yes, exactly. He, He wanted to be seen by as many people as possible so that when he got home and found his wife dead, he wouldn't be a suspect. I think that was the motivation there, yeah. That was the the plan, anyway. So Fred pulled up that Tuesday evening about 20 after 9, and everything looked normal. Carol's car was parked in its usual place. The front door was unlocked, but that wasn't unusual. There was nothing outside of the house to suggest anything had happened there. Yeah, but as soon as Fred stepped inside of the house, it was obvious that something was very wrong. He could see Carol's feet sticking out from the living room into the entrance hall. Inside the living room, the scene was a real horror show. The contrast between the pristine white room and the blood spatter all over the walls, floor, and furniture was very startling. And Carol, of course, was badly beaten, and there was a large pool of blood surrounding her head. So Fred picked up the cordless phone, which Carol had left in the front hallway after she had finished her call with her daughter, and he called 911. He started out saying that he had just come home and his wife was on the floor and there's blood all over the place. He said he didn't know what to do. So he was on the phone with the 911 operator for about seven minutes. As police cars and the ambulance rushed to the address, Fred never mentioned to the operator what he believed had happened to his wife. So based on what he had been telling her, the operator thought it was likely a suicide. Well, yeah, and remember, there hadn't been any homicides And this is October. No, this is the 1st of November. 
and there haven't been any other homicides in that area, so it's a safe area. Very safe area. So why would murder even enter their minds? It wouldn't, and he wasn't telling her all the information. He just, I've gotten home, and my wife is dead, and there's blood all over the place. Yeah, right. Well, 911 operators are taught to determine if a weapon was used when dealing with a suicide call. They want to know where the weapon is, and they want the caller to stay away from it. But Fred said he didn't see any weapon. But then Fred seemed to remember that Matthew was working for the Cherry Hill EMS that night. So there really was a good possibility that he could be dispatched to the scene of his own mother's murder. But Fred and the operator didn't realize that Matthew Newlander had heard the message about someone being seriously hurt at his home address. So he and his crew were already on their way. Fred seemed quite hysterical on the call. After the first officer arrived on the scene, he hung up with the operator as he was told to do, and the first thing he said to the officer was, what do you want me to do? So Fred had called 911 at 9.22 p.m., and at 9.29, help began to arrive at the house. It was immediately obvious to the officers and detectives that Carol had been beaten to death. So Matthew arrived at the scene, went up to the front windows, and through them he could see police officers inside his house with their guns drawn. A group of them were staring something on the living room floor. Then a fellow EMT guided him away from the house and led him to his father, who was standing at the end of their driveway. Matt asked him repeatedly what had happened, but all Fred was able to say was that he had found Carol lying on the floor when he got home. Matt asked if his mother was dead, and Fred said he didn't know. Yeah, an EMT came out moments later, though, and confirmed that Carol was indeed dead. Matthew was devastated, but he was also suspicious of his father right off. He asked Fred a series of questions. He wanted to know where Fred had been, and he also wanted to take a close look at Fred's clothing. And he was surprised, really, because he thought Fred had done it. But then he was also relieved to see no visible blood on his father. Fred had seemed appropriately shocked and upset while speaking to the 911 operator, but as he stood outside of his home and the police began a homicide investigation, he started seeming very calm and composed. And he just told Matthew that everything would be okay. Remember, Carol was well-loved and respected in this community. That evening, at least 50 people came by the house to offer their condolences and support. Rebecca, the daughter, was picked up by a family friend and driven from her Philadelphia apartment to her family home. The house by then was surrounded by marked and unmarked cars, and she found her father sitting on a bench inside of an ambulance that was parked in their driveway. The assistant rabbi, Mazo, arrived at the house to find it roped off with yellow crime scene tape. The police were dusting the house for fingerprints, too. Fred was still in the ambulance, just sitting there with his head in his hands. He asked Rabbi Mazo to arrange the traditional Jewish confession for the dead, for Carol, and also to get the family's address book from the house. He also asked Mazo to call Benjamin at the University of Michigan and tell him what had happened. Now, what do you think about that? Is that something the father should have done himself? Well, yeah, I think so. I think so, too. Why would you tell you know, a stranger or even a family friend or whatever to call your son. That's a little weird to me. It is. I, um, you know, I'm not trying to make excuses. Maybe he was just not able to do it. He just didn't feel like he could talk to his son at that point. Yeah. I know you're being devil's advocate, but I kind of see it like he knew he'd done something wrong, and you don't want to call and tell anyone anything when you know that it's your fault. You've got that guilty feeling. That's the way I see it happening. Okay. But who knows? So as the house was processed by the forensic unit, experts examined Carol's injuries in the area around her body. But outside of the living room, that horrible scene, the house was actually spotless and neat. So it didn't look like there'd been a robbery, really. No, other than that one room. Now, Carol's scalp had multiple lacerations. The coroner would later note that she had been hit in the head a dozen times, was something like a tire iron. Six of these hits were parallel to one another, suggesting that Carol had not been moving when she was hit. She also had some wounds on her hands that suggested she had been trying to protect herself. 
One of her fingers was nearly severed. Now, although her head had been severely beaten, the thing that actually killed her was that she choked on her own vomit. If she hadn't choked on her vomit, certainly the head wounds would have killed her. It's just that the, the choking did it first. Well, Carol was still wearing her diamond engagement ring and her wedding band. She was still wearing her favorite gold necklace, too, which had six diamonds set in the center. On her wrist, she also wrist, she also had several expensive bracelets and a very expensive watch. So there's another thing that makes it not seem like a robbery. There was no sign of forced entry, and no finger or shoe prints were recovered. No trace evidence was recovered from Carol's body, either. It was determined that nothing had been stolen except for the burgundy wallet. So to experienced homicide detectives, robbery did not seem to be the motive. To the, inexper- to the inexperience, the crime may have been written off as a home invasion or a robbery gone awry, but it would be an unusual one. Once Rebecca Newlander arrived, she explained to detectives about her mother's interactions with the bathroom man and she told them that this had been his second visit to the Newlander house while Carol was home alone. So that really perked up their ears, and this became very important. Certainly did. The news of this bathroom man gave police a prime suspect in Carol's murder. They didn't know much about him at all, but it was important to note that the man had specifically asked for the rabbi, so it didn't appear to be a random home invasion. Someone had known the Newlanders, and had purposely gone to their home. And this was twice, one week before and the night of the killing. Right, both on Tuesdays. Dick, why are you smashing your headphones to bits? I am just so frustrated listening to ads. Why can't I listen to my favorite podcasts without those annoying ads? Well, I can't help you with other podcasts. However, True Crime Brewery now comes commercial-free for our Tie Grabber members. Huh? That's right. If you subscribe at any level, you get to listen to all of our new episodes commercial-free. And this is in addition to our bonus episodes each month. Plus, you get some great TCB swag mailed to you when you join. At least I can listen to True Crime Brewery ad-free. I really wish other podcasts would do that. Uh, and Jill? Yeah? Do you know where the glue is? Uh, I, I just pounded up my last pair of headphones. So detectives knew that the second visit would indicate something more than a robbery had been planned. Right. And if the killer had intended to rob Carol, why had he only taken the wallet? She had been wearing expensive jewelry and it looked like none of the house had been searched for valuables. Well, one big problem was that Rebecca had no idea who this bathroom man really was. She didn't know what he looked like or what kind of car he drove, or even how he knew Fred Newlander. They soon learned about Carol's dangerous routine of bringing home large amounts of cash. If the classic cake cash was the motive in the killing, then it was absolutely some kind of an inside job. Since she didn't know the bathroom man... They thought he may have been hired by someone or helping someone. And now we've talked about this sort of thing in the past. And certainly the spouse uh, and also the person who discovers the body, the usual initial prime suspects. Now, Fred was both husband and discoverer. Now, as detectives talk to family members and friends of the Newlanders, they learn more about their marriage and they grew more suspicious of Fred. Well, I think he looked pretty suspicious early on. It's just it was hard to really get him on anything. But because of the high stakes in a murder case, detectives really expect that people cooperating with an investigation are going to give them truthful answers to any of their questions. So when someone lies in this situation, detectives do see it as significant. Just what inconsistency can be very meaningful to a case. So on the very night of Carol's murder, Detectives already believed that her husband was lying to them, so that made them look even more at Fred. It sure did. So detectives canvassed the neighborhood right away. No one they spoke to remembered anything suspicious between 7 and 9 p.m. The next-door neighbors did see Fred and Matthew through their kitchen window at 6 p.m. eating dinner. And they also noticed that Carol's car 
was not parked in the driveway at that time. Two hours after Fred found Carol, their son Matthew spoke with detectives. Remember, this was the, the one, the, the ENT yes. crew? Mm-hmm. Who basically thought his father was responsible. Yes, he did, which is pretty remarkable. It is. They've been married almost 30 years, and he's thinking his father killed his mother. Yeah, that's just, you know, crushing. Well, Matthew told the detectives about some upsetting conversations in the home two nights before his mother was murdered. Yeah, Carol and Fred had gone over the weekend to visit some relatives in New York. When they returned on the night of Sunday, October 30th, Matthew could tell right away that his mother was upset. She and Fred had been having an argument on the trip home. So Carol told Matthew that his father had something important to tell him. But Fred wouldn't say anything. He remained silent. Then Carol told Matthew that his father was leaving. She said that he was seeking a divorce from her. And Matthew was pretty shocked. This was completely unexpected. Later, Carol told Matthew that she and Fred had discussed it and everything was going to be fine. But then, just a few minutes later, when Matthew talked to his dad, Fred told him to prepare for the worst. So they're both coming out of there with different descriptions of their conversations and decisions. Some mixed messages, huh? Yes. The day Carol died, she called Matthew at 4.30 in the afternoon and reassured him that she and Fred had settled their differences and they were planning on going to see a marriage counselor. So it sounds like, again... Maybe no divorce. Well, and that makes you wonder, was Fred trying to make her think that things were going to work? Sure. So in the conversation with his mother made Matthew feel better. When he had his pizza dinner with Fred later that day, before he went to his work shift, he tried to talk to it, to Fred about it, but Fred brushed off his son's attempt to talk to him. So he didn't want to have anything to do with that. No, and just a few hours later, when Matthew learned that his mother had been murdered in her own home, Of course he couldn't help but worry that his father was responsible. Well, that's a reasonable guess, I think. Yes. But it's just remarkable they've been married, like, forever. Yeah, I mean, the the tone of this is that the whole thing came out of the blue. Well, it certainly didn't, but I think maybe to their son it did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, detectives had examined Fred for blood on his clothing or hands, noted there was none visible. Now, this made Matthew conclude that his father was innocent, but the detectives saw this as more suspicion. Now, they wouldn't expect him to be covered in blood spatter, but why didn't he even have any blood on his hands from touching his wife? I mean, this this wasn't just some strange corpse. This was the woman he'd been married to for 30 years. So the fact that he didn't approach Carol or touch her to see if she was breathing or had a pulse seemed odd to the detectives. Now, at the same time, it was understandable that he might have assumed Carol was dead just by looking at her, because there's this huge blood stain surrounding her head on the carpet, and she was just uh, pale as a ghost. Sure, I still just kind of feel like if that was his beloved wife, he would have run to her, because you would just think, you know, if there's any chance, you know. Right, you would. But... The fact that a divorce had been mentioned recently did give the investigators more to consider about Fred Newlander. When Fred was asked about the bathroom man and how Carol had told Rebecca that Fred had told her to expect someone with a package, he said he had no knowledge of any delivery being expected. He also said that Carol had never shown him or told him about the empty envelope that she'd been given from the man on the first visit. But then in a couple of hours, Fred contradicted himself. He said that Carol had told him about a weird guy who had asked to use the bathroom. She had told him the previous week, he said, but he couldn't recall the exact day. But after that, detectives got right into the state of the Newlander marriage. Fred denied that either of them had had an affair, and he called their marriage great. Now then police talked to the employees at Classic Cake and they learned that all of the cash receipts were accounted for and locked in a safe at the bakery. So it turns out that the night she was killed wasn't a night when Carol brought a large amount of cash home with her. Yes, she just happened to not do it that night. Yep. 
Now, the head baker also told detectives that Carol had mentioned that her husband wasn't speaking to her. This was just the day before her death. Right. She'd given him the impression that she'd had some kind of argument with Fred and he wasn't speaking to her. But the 30-year-old assistant rabbi, Mazo, didn't know of any relationship issues between Fred and Carol Newlander. And he also gave an alibi for Fred. He remembered Fred stopping by at 7.40 p.m. for about 20 minutes. Then after going and making some calls, he returned to the class at 8.45. So Mazo and his wife Debbie left the temple around 9.20, and Fred was still there. But the one person whose answers didn't fit in with what the detectives knew to be true was Fred Newlander. So because of that, they're going to look further into his life. Now remember, Fred was at the house discovering his wife at 9.20, so Mazel was a little off there. Right, just a bit. Jewish tradition calls for a quick burial, but because of the investigation and the necessity of an autopsy, Carol's funeral happened on Thursday, November 3rd. There were a 1,000 members at the temple Wednesday night for her memorial, and over 2,000 people attended the funeral on Thursday the day after. Meanwhile, police are doing their investigating. They learned that a dark-colored car had been seen in the area between 7 and 9 the evening of Carol's murder. They didn't discuss details with the press, but they did say that they did not believe it was a random murder. Rumors of an affair surrounded Fred in the weeks after Carol's murder. What he wasn't admitting was that he'd been having sex with one woman in particular, a tall redhead who was a local talk radio host. So her name is Elaine Sonsini, and she was the host of the Morning Drive Time Show on WPEN-AM in Philadelphia. She and Fred had been meeting just about every day of the week at her house in Cherry Hill. They usually met at lunchtime, but sometimes in the evenings as well. In fact, on the day Carol was killed, Fred had spent his lunch hour with Elaine. So Elaine was recently widowed. None of her friends knew about the affair with the rabbi. She'd been married to another well-known radio personality for 22 years. Then, in early 1992, her husband had been diagnosed with leukemia. So his health had steadily declined, and he died in December of 1992. Elaine was a Catholic. Elaine was a Catholic, but the rabbi had been in the room offering support when her husband died. He offered comfort afterwards. And before you know it, it led to their affair. As they stood side by side at the cemetery, lowering Elaine's husband into the ground, Fred turned to her and asked if he could call her sometime. (laughs) Can you imagine? No. At the funeral. It's like a, a joke. I can't believe anyone would really do that. Well, and she didn't smack him or anything. No. I, I would just be... Well, no, she liked him. Well, I know that, but still. I know. I mean... Her husband of 20-some years is being buried, (laughs) and here's the rabbi hitting on her. Well, yeah, I hate to laugh, but it's just his behavior is comical. Yeah, and hers is weird. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. It's just, you know, being a rabbi, you think he would know better, right? Right. But after that, only a week passed before they had lunch together, and they kissed that day, and then within the month, they were having sex. They even had sex at the temple on at least one occasion. Yeah, they had a lot of sex, apparently. (laughs) Now, within a couple weeks of Carol's murder, detectives got the Newlander phone records, dating back to several months. They saw that Elaine Sonsini and her radio station were called frequently. When they interviewed Elaine, she told the detectives that she and Fred were close friends. She insisted that they were not romantically or sexually involved. Right, and it would come out that Fred told her to say that. But detectives were watching Elaine. That December, they began to stop by her house and ask her questions, and she was beginning to wonder if Fred could have had his wife killed in order to be with her. So she was afraid to be looked at as a motive or maybe even an accomplice. So she finally told the detectives the truth. She hired an attorney first and went into the police station to talk to them. But it turns out Elaine wasn't Fred's only lover. Nope. I guess she was like the main squeeze that he might have really been in love with. But he'd been sleeping with other women for a while. Yeah, there was one congregation member who had been receiving marriage counseling by Fred Newlander. She had sex with him. 
and another woman came forward to say that she had met him through a personal ad. She described Fred as lewd and pushy, and he asked her to have sex in a hotel the same evening they met, and she turned him down. Well, good for her. Yeah, someone has some scruples, morals, whatever. Taste, yeah. Taste. Well, Rabbi Gary Mazzo and his wife, who was a fellow rabbi, Debbie Pipe Mazzo, had been really close friends with the Newlanders for over 10 years. The Newlanders had actually traveled to Israel to visit them when they were students there. So Mazo considered Fred to be his mentor, and he was happy to be the assistant rabbi when he began in 1990 at Makor Shalom. Things had gone well, but in 1994, Newlander was asked by the Makor Shalom board to take a six-month sabbatical. Usually, a rabbi would do something like go to Israel, do some intense studying, or even write their own book during their sabbatical. But Fred kind of shocked the board by just hanging around Cherry Hill the entire time. He played racquetball and lifted weights, and he would still go in and wander around the synagogue every day. He was also seeing Elaine on most days. And there was some pretty valid speculation that Fred was having a midlife crisis. He was 53 or 54. Yeah. At that age. Wasn't too over the hill. Now, detectives <laughs> told Mazo that Carol's murder looked more like a hit than a botched robbery. And they asked him a lot of questions about Fred's personal life. Near the end of 1994, friends of Carol put up a $35,000 reward in an attempt to figure out who did it. Fred hired a private detective who was also a member of Makor Shalom. This guy's name was Leonard Jenoff. And this is an important character in this case. He's a leading character. Jenoff was an odd guy, and he claimed to have experience working for the CIA. He volunteered at the synagogue, and he and the rabbi would go out back together and smoke cigarettes. Jenoff knew many of the police in the area, and he became very vocal about defending Fred's innocence after Carol was killed. Then Matthew began to defend his father as well. He was claiming that the rumors were just ridiculous. In February of 1995, local newspapers reported that Fred Newlander was a member of the suspect pool. The evidence linking him to Carol's murder was circumstantial, but the McCor Shalom Board of Trustees announced that the rabbi would be taking an indefinite leave of absence. Then four days later... Fred submitted a letter resigning his position permanently. In the letter, the senior rabbi also made reference to his affairs with women outside of his marriage, and he said that reports had revealed information he wasn't proud of, but obviously he had nothing to do with his wife's death. By the summer of 1995, Fred Newlander was hardly ever seen in public. He read a lot. He volunteered to help with projects and some Jewish charities. In August, prosecutors stated publicly that they were considering Newlander had hired a hitman to kill his wife. So for the first time, the bathroom man was mentioned as a suspect. Fred called his own press conference that same day and read a prepared statement to reporters with his newly hired attorneys at his side. He denied any involvement with Carol's murder. So Elaine, the girlfriend, gave a series of interviews denying her involvement. She said that she was helping with the investigation and she admitted to having an affair with Newlander for two years. The affair had continued for several months after Carol died, but she had broken it off when she learned that he was cheating on her with another woman, third one. So she remembered that Fred had expressed concern to her more than once about what a divorce would do to his position as senior rabbi. Might not look good. Wouldn't look good. So when talking about the evening of Carol's murder, Elaine said that Fred had told her he couldn't see her because he had a class he had forgotten about. Usually he came to her house on Tuesday evenings. Investigators became concerned that Elaine might be potentially Fred's next victim if she had been the motive for Carol's murder. So the, the police put up a 24-hour guard on Elaine. Yeah, now Fred's private investigator, Len Jenoff, went to the press to say that Fred only lied to keep his extramarital affairs secret, and he was innocent of the murder. For close to three years, there seemed to be little progress in the case. Many of the investigators believed that Fred was guilty, but they didn't have enough evidence. 
In New Jersey, soliciting murder for hire is a capital offense, and the death penalty is a real possibility here. So in September of 1997, a grand jury was convened. Among those subpoenaed were Rabbi Gary Mazzo, Elaine Sincini, and Matthew Newlander. Then, Fred's smoking buddy and P.I., Len Jenoff, was subpoenaed to appear as well. In 1998, Fred was indicted for murder. The case was completely circumstantial, but that changed two years later in April of 2000. At this time, Len Jenoff was persuaded by a Philadelphia Inquirer reporter to tell police what he knew about the crime. So the day before Fred Newlander's conspiracy trial was to start, Jenoff confessed to the Inquirer reporter, Nancy Phillips. And after receiving the confession, the prosecution amended the charges against Newlander to include the identities of his co-conspirators. So Jenoff's version of events was that he cased the Newlander home. His use of the bathroom earned him the nickname the bathroom man from Carol. She was murdered when Jenoff and his buddy Daniels returned the following Tuesday and entered the Newlander home while Carol was home alone. So Leonard was 47 years old and a recovering alcoholic. He'd recently separated from his second wife when he met Fred for the first time in June of 1993. He was seeking counseling for low self-esteem. His home was in foreclosure, and his application for financial assistance had been rejected by Jewish Family Services. And at their first meeting, Jenoff told Fred about his background. He lied about having a college degree and about working for years with the Baltimore Police and the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. He also bragged that he was involved in the Iran-Contra affair. According to Jenoff, he created a false background for himself because it was just more exciting. He began to go to Friday night services at Makor Shalom, and Jenoff described Fred as his mentor, his friend, and his rabbi. Yeah, he looked at Fred as someone who basically saved his life. Fred took an interest in him, helped him, and and he was improving. Yeah, I think there was definitely the factor of feeling like he owed Fred something. I think so, too. Yeah. It wasn't just for the money. No. I was just going to help out my friend. Right. And maybe kind of impress him. Right. Yeah. So starting in March of 1994, AA meetings were held at Makor Shalom every Tuesday night from 7 to 8. Jennifer would arrive at the synagogue around 5 o'clock to set up the meeting. Then he'd go see Fred. They would take a walk together around the synagogue's parking lot and smoke. Sometime in March or April of 94, Fred asked Jenoff if he would kill for the state of Israel, and Jenoff said that he would. Yeah, so in late April of 1994, Fred again brought it up and told Jenoff that an evil enemy to the state of Israel lived in Cherry Hill. Fred explained that this person should be killed. A week later, Fred drove Jenoff to his house and said the person he wanted him to kill was actually his wife, Carol. Jenoff said that he was afraid to say no for fear of losing his friendship with Fred. And according to Jenoff, Fred told him he wanted to come home one night and find his wife dead on the floor. So that's eerie. Fred told Jenoff he would pay him $30,000 and he would also get him a job if he did it. How can you turn that down? Well, most people could, but he couldn't. (laughs) So they discussed the details of how they were going to do the murder, talked about different methods, and ruled them all out. One was kind of weird. It was going to involve a theater in New York. They were going to go to a theater, and as they came out of the theater, Jenoff was going to fire a gun and kill Carol and wound Fred so that Fred would not be a suspect. That was decided against. Well, in early June of 1994, Fred had decided that he wanted Carol's murder to happen in their home and also on a Tuesday night. He said that it was the best time and place because it would look like a robbery. He told Jenoff not to use a knife and suggested that he use a blunt instrument so that it would look like a robbery gone awry. Fred wanted Carol killed immediately, but then Jenoff was able to convince him to wait until the fall when it would get dark out earlier. So in August of 94, Jenoff suggested to Fred that he might need to get another person to help him with the murder. So he asked this 21-year-old roommate he had whose name is Paul Daniels. He went by the nickname Deuce. So he was getting him to help with the murder. 
But Daniels had a pretty serious drug and alcohol problem, and he was also on medication for some serious psychiatric problems. So he was pretty malleable. He was. This guy was on at least four different antipsychotics. He was a paranoid schizophrenic. Yeah, so. This was a a tough one. And then Jenoff offered him $7,500, which was a fortune to Daniels, and he agreed to do the job. Then in early October, Fred met Jenoff in the parking lot of the Sheraton Hotel in Cherry Hill, and he handed Jenoff an envelope with $7,500 in it, saying it was the first down payment for killing my wife. So he's just right out there about it. I guess he's feeling pretty sure that Jenoff's not working for the police. I guess so. Now Fred gave Jenoff a hand-drawn map of the interior of his house. He explained to Jenoff that Carol kept a burgundy purse with the cash in it. She brought that home from the Classic Cake Company. He told Jenoff, take the purse, but do not take Carol's diamond ring. And he also told Jenoff not to ransack the house, not to go upstairs, and not to ruin the furniture. (laughs) (laughs) What the hell? Then he said, make sure when I come home I find her dead. Such a prince. Jeez. Huh? What a sweetheart. So Fred and his defense team claim that Jenoff and Daniels acted independently and that their motive was pure robbery. They claim that Jenoff knew that Carol ran her own business, Classic Cakes, and that she frequently brought cash home. So Jenoff, needing money and being armed with that knowledge, went off on his own and recruited Daniels, and then killed Carol for that money. Yeah, now, how would they know about her bringing large sums of money home? Well, Fred would have had to have told him. And why would he tell them? I mean, this is... Yeah, it's, a, it's not the greatest defense. I know, it's, it's a terrible alibi. Yeah, but still, I was pretty shocked that this first trial resulted in a hung jury. This one had been impaneled in Camden County, and the area newspapers reported that the jury hung 9-3 to three in favor of a guilty verdict. So then, because of all this heavy media coverage in Camden County, his retrial was moved to Monmouth County. Yeah, and at the retrial, Fred was found guilty. And by this time, his son Matthew was also convinced of his father's guilt. Yeah, I think all three of the kids did not help him with their testimony. No. Although the younger son, during the sentencing period, was active. Because the jury declined to sentence Newlander to death, and he was sentenced to 30 years to life but that may have been partially due to his son pleading for him to stay alive. Right. Even though I don't think he believed he was innocent, he had just forgiven him. So in December of 2006, the appellate division of the New Jersey courts denied Fred's appeal. His appellate counsel had argued that the court had made an error by not allowing Newlander to argue a third-party liability defense based on a similar home invasion burglary murder that had happened in Cherry Hill. Newlander also argued and was denied on the issue of hearsay evidence in the out-of-court statement by Carol, told by her daughter, about their telephone conversation about the bathroom man. So he's currently imprisoned in New Jersey State Prison. Jenoff and Daniels both avoided a death sentence for their murder for hire by pleading guilty to aggravated manslaughter and agreeing to testify against Fred Newlander. At their sentencing, Carol Newlander's brother, Edward Litz, told the court that although he appreciated Jenoff's testimony, he felt that both men already got a break when they were allowed to plead guilty to something less than murder. No one forced them to enter Carol's home and take her life, he said. They did it to get the money. Simply put, they accepted a price for a human life set by Fred Newlander. But a victim's advocate read a letter signed by all three kids, Matthew, Benjamin, and Rebecca, and they called the two men monsters. These men are not star witnesses. These men are cold-blooded murderers, the letter said. So both Jenoff and Daniels were sentenced to 23 years, and both were released from prison in 2014. Interesting. Yeah, so they each served about 14 years. Hopefully, Daniel's got some psychiatric help because he was severely mentally ill. He was in deep trouble. Yeah. So our sources on this case include a book titled Broken Vows, written by Eric Francis. 
another book, The Rabbi and the Hitman by Arthur J. Megida. The Courier Post New Jersey Archives, The New York Times Archives, SouthJerseyNews.com, The Murderpedia page, although I have to say I found a lot of inaccuracies there, but that's not uncommon. No, I've found the same thing when looking up stuff. Yeah. Also, CourtTV.com had a lot of really helpful information. TCB's music was written and produced by Tristan Capel. If you enjoy listening to our little shows, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen. If you visit our website, tigrabber.com, you'll find a shopping page where you can buy some really cool brewery merch. We have warm, soft hoodies ready as the cooler weather moves in this autumn. And now we also have cloth masks to keep you safe and also to declare your TCB love when you're out in public. You can also subscribe to our members-only show, True Crime Brewery Premium, on our website. Remember, as a member, you get a new bonus episode every month, add three versions of our weekly show, access to over 40 bonus episodes, and of course, we'll send you a gift with a handwritten thank you note. Also, once you're a member, you don't have to listen to these self-promotions anymore. Okay, enough of that. Let's do some feedback. Okay, kind of the usual pattern. I got a voicemail and a couple emails for you. The, the voicemail is from Stacy, and she has a case suggestion. Hi, Dick and Jill. My name is Stacy Packham, and I live in Gainesville, Florida. I have been a true crime fan since the age of 11 and have been reading true crime books for many decades. I won't give my age, but I consider myself extremely well-versed on most stories. I don't recall hearing if you've ever done the story about 11-year-old Amy Burridge and her 18-year-old sister Becky that were kidnapped from the grocery store. One was thrown off a bridge and survived. I don't want to tell you more about the story. The book is called The Darkest Night, written by Ron Francell. It's one of the most haunting true crime stories that I've ever read, and it continues to haunt me. Anyways, I'm sending this voicemail since you mentioned on the podcast this morning that you haven't received any lately. (laughs) I love your podcast. Can't wait till Tuesday morning on my drive into work to listen. I look forward to it weekly. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Well, gee, thanks, Stacy. The main reason I wanted to play that is because I really wanted to talk a little bit about an 11-year-old and true crime. What do you think? Seems young. Yeah, she got an early start. She sure did. And I just wonder if that would make her in her teens and her younger years a little more paranoid than normal. So that would be an interesting conversation. Maybe more paranoid, maybe more uh, aware. Definitely more aware. I feel like we're much more aware since we've been doing the podcast. Yes. And also this case. We did cover this case. We did this case. It was uh, New Year's Day, 2019, when it was released. I think it was titled Bridge of Sorrow or something like that. Okay. Uh, But it's the story of the two girls. And I I won't uh, give away all the information except to say it's there in the queue of episodes. And it was one I thought we did a pretty good job on. Well, I know it was an upsetting story, that's for sure. It was. I mean, really upsetting, just horrible, because I think it's one of those things that I could relate to as something that could have happened. I might have said so in the show, actually, but I think a lot of women can relate to what happened there, and it's like your worst nightmare. It is. So thanks a lot, Stacy. We really appreciate your listening and having some mercy on me and sending me a voicemail. That was <laughs> very kind. It was. And we'll close by saying, go Gators. Okay. In a couple emails, one's from Laura. She has a case suggestion. So she says, I really like how you both present the cases you do. You definitely do your homework. You are witty and clever on how you share the story. You know when to laugh, when to cry, and when to be serious. With all that said, I'm a devout listener. I have a case that I hope you might do. Garrett Phillips. I watched the documentary. It's very sad but it is still an open case. I'd like to hear your version and what you have to say. Thank you for all your hard work on doing these cases. Well, thank you, Laura. I am familiar with that case. We've seen a documentary on it. I think we did watch it, yes. 
because I remembered he, he's a little 12-year-old who was strangled to death in his home in 2011. And I remembered that it was mom's ex-boyfriend who was one of the few black men in town and a soccer coach or some kind of coach. Soccer coach, yeah. Uh, he was charged with the murder but was acquitted. And the case is still open. Yeah, there is the whole race thing. And there's also the fact that they really didn't have much for evidence. No, they didn't at all. I mean, the motive wasn't even great. So, yeah, I would definitely consider doing that if you want to add it to our list. I'll add it in. Okay. It, it, was, it was a good case. Yeah, I think there's a lot to talk about with that. And I think that when, when you talk to the prosecution, they feel that even though Hillary was acquitted, he's the one that did it. Well, that's the normal thing that prosecutors think, unless they find another suspect. Well, there but, is another suspect. Actually, there's a couple that were mentioned. One is that some other kid did it. That he had been having some problems with some kids at school or in the playground, uh, and that one of them might have done it. That sounds a little far-fetched for a 12-year-old or 13-year-old. It does, yes. And then there's another ex-boyfriend of the mother who is a potential suspect. But the overwhelming suspicion is that Hillary was the perpetrator. Well, and I think that's what the mother believes. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. Okay, one more email. It's a case suggestion from Sue, and she's recommending the case against Darlene Gentry, who murdered her husband and was caught red-handed and on video in a sting operation where she was trying to recover the murder weapon she'd tossed in a pond. Love that. <laughs> I do, too. I was telling you earlier, Dickie, I just love it when people get caught on video. <laughs> yeah. And she still had the gall to maintain her innocence. If you decide to do these stories, I'll be interested to see what new details you discover. As for beer, my husband is into craft beer and occasionally stops to listen to your reviews. But I'm a Miller Lite girl. I know, the horror. <laughs> I won't hold that against you. Oh, you're a little horrified, though, aren't you? No. No. Hope that doesn't stop you from considering these cases. So what do we know about Darlene Gentry? Well, Darlene, I won't go too far into this. It's an interesting story. Darlene was a Texas beauty queen, aren't they all? Seems like a lot of them are. It's, it's popular. She killed her husband in 2005, blaming it on a home invasion. The police didn't like her story right from the very start. She was arrested, tried, and found guilty of murder and given a sentence of 60 years. Yeah, we chatted about this one a while back. Did we? Yeah, we did. Okay. And I thought, wow, that's pretty crazy. It is it crazy. It was kind of stupid the way she did it from what we were reading. Yeah. From the start, she claimed that she woke up and her husband was missing or gone or something. His gun safe had been ransacked, and there he was dead. And then when the police came, they found the guns right outside the door. <laughs> Wow. Uh, except that the murder weapon was missing. Okay. So, <laughs> so that looks like we could have a good talk about that. We could. Let's add that to the list. I'm going to. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening and for your case suggestions. We do really appreciate it. And we will see you next time at The Quiet End. At The Quiet End. And we'll hopefully have some more voicemails. Right, folks? Yeah, keep them coming. All right. Mama likes voicemails. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.